So in you know most of you know lecture I'm going to present today and some of the lecture the next one we are going to talk about some deep learning architectures and you know the reason we are talking about them is because you know in reinforcement learning you know for example if i want to include information from a long time back right we cannot use straight up fully connected networks or convolutional networks we must rely on things like rnns or graph networks or you know even transformers so it's important to understand some of those architectures because they will be useful to your projects but also as you think about solving problems like credit assignment and you know how to convert you know how to deal with non markov systems so that's pretty much the motivation of you know why we are you know spending some time on deep learning and specifically today you know we'll cover some standard architectures all the way from resnets to transformers and we'll also look at some miscellaneous concepts which keep on showing up so specifically forward and reverse kl and uncertainty estimation right okay so you know i mean most of you are probably very familiar with feed forward networks and you know you know uh that you know we have an input layer we have an output layer and we have a bunch of hidden layers in the middle right and you know we are probably also familiar with convolutional neural networks where you have an input image but you process the input image through a sequence of uh you know like filters which are applied at the same filters applied at different locations which con constitutes a convolution and there are multiple layers of convolutions and probably you're also familiar with the fact that once imagenet came about which was a data set of around 1.2 million images which were hand annotated and we had good compute power via gpus you know there it became possible to train deep convolutional networks where i think the famous example from 2012 is the network with seven layers which was trained on this classification task to go from images to these labels right and if you were to follow how performance was changing at the time so these are you know teams like different teams are uh, competing on the imagenet classification challenge the challenge is given an image we need to categorize it into one out of 1000 categories and on the y axis we are plotting the error on the x axis of the teams so these were all pretty much non deep learning based approaches which were popular in 2011 2012 and you know when this deep learning architecture came about it almost halved the error rates and that is pretty much what spurred the deep learning revolution in computer vision then you know in robotics and reinforcement learning and so on and so forth and so that's in some ways this history now you know just you know to give a sense of you know what this architecture looked like you know i mean it had you know these seven layers five of which were convolutional layers and we had a couple of fully connected layers in the end so i'm going to assume that everyone you know in this class knows about convolutions max pooling and fully connected layers you know if you have questions about it you know i would encourage you to see you know either lectures from 6036 or even 6867 or you know there's amazing resources online which will explain you what a convolution is and what pooling is and what fully connected networks are so you know one thing which is you know fun to note about alexnet is that although it has these you know seven layers most of the parameters actually sit in the you know fully connected layers this is what has most of the parameters and you know this is because there's a connection which goes from 4096 to 4096 right which ends up you know around 16 million parameters sitting right over there so 
you know why why is this important right so so one reason you know this is important is so over here the input image is 227 227 cross 3 and then we applied five convolutional layers and max pooling and my image size is 6 cross 6 cross 256 right and then i'm applying a layer of 4096 for so there is a huge number of parameters even sitting at this interface. So one thing to note, you know, many times what people end up doing is they have an input image, but they would only, you know, for example, use two convolutional layers and then directly end up applying an FC layer, which has say 4,000 neurons. You know, in that case, the number of parameters you end up having, you know, really blows up. Right, because now you have 27 cross 27, which is you know almost 800. So 800 cross 256 cross 4096, right, which would be a huge number of parameters. So you know the takeaway which I want you to have is that if you are using a confnet, and if you are going to put a fully connected layer, which you would put, for example, if you have to predict the probability of taking an action or if you are building a Q network, right, you have a mapping which, you know, predicts the Q value for each action. So always, you know, go and look at the feature map size of the convolutional layer, just preceding the fully connected layer, you know, and just make sure that that size is reasonable and you don't have a huge number of parameters sitting over there. So just something to you know keep in mind when using uh, convnets or customizing convnets. Thing to also remember is that this image net had 1.2 billion images, right? But the number of parameters that we had were around 60 million. So the number of parameters is orders of magnitude more than the number of images. So if you were you know, studying traditional or conventional machine learning theory, this is a recipe for disaster because this is a recipe for overfitting right? because we have way too many parameters as compared to number of data points that are there. But this you know, has been a common story throughout deep learning where, you know, deep networks, which by what that I mean, like networks with a large number of layers with very large number of parameters don't end up overfitting to the training set. Now, why that happens, you know, there is a lot of exciting work happening in that direction. You know, happy to chat about it in my office hours, but you know, we'll not go into that in this particular course, but it's worth noting the number of parameters can be, you know, much larger than the number of data points that you have, right? So, I mean, again, why I'm telling you that is, you know, if you are building your deep RL agent, you know, don't be so afraid of the number of parameters that you have. So, I mean, just as an anecdote also, right? I mean, in computer vision, we are using the seven layer networks, which are, or maybe even 50 and 100 layer networks, which are very common now, versus in reinforcement learning, you know, even when people say deep reinforcement learning, many times they end up using two or a three layer network. It's what you would find in most works. Now, you know, why is that the case? You know, it's something, you know, that we will see in bits and pieces in parts of the course once we discuss, you know, some examples. But just an anecdote to, you know, deep RL people don't really use very deep networks. But there are, you know, many other avenues in sensory motor learning, for example, in self-supervised learning and imitation learning, where it is much more common to use much deeper networks. So, you know, this AlexNet, you know, came along, it had, you know, seven to eight layers, depending on how you count. And then, 
you know, there was a flurry of architectures which came along. So there was a VGG network, which had 19 layers and Google net came along, which had 22 layers. And finally, you know, we ended up with ResNex, which had 152 layers, right? So these networks were really large in the number of layers, but not necessarily in the number of parameters. So, you know, why did we start going from, you know, eight layer networks to 152 layer networks, right? And, and the simple reason is that as people were adding more layers, the performance was increasing. So going from eight to 19 or eight to 20 still required, you know, some intuition and some engineering, but it was possible to do so. Uh, but you know, when people start, you know, wanted to really go beyond 19 or 20 layers, you know, many issues started cropping up. And in the general, uh, you know, the general cause of the issue was the gradients either becoming really small if the number of layers increase or the gradients becoming really large. Now, what do I mean by that? Right. So suppose, you know, we have our input X and we have the output, which is Y is equal to W X. Right? And we initialize this new network with weights W and N in refers to the number of neurons in the input layer and N out refers to number of neurons in the output layer. So now if, so, so one thing that you would care about is if I have my input and suppose my input has some variance, say variance of one, then what is the variance of my output layer? Now, why does this matter? And suppose if you had a deep network and in each layer, if the variance was increasing, then, you know, if you stack many, many layers, the variance can become really large, which can create numerical instabilities, right? Similarly, if the variance is being reduced quite a lot, for example, the variance is one, then it goes down by a factor of 0.1 with every layer that you add, then in no time, the variance will become really, really small, right? So what does that mean? You know, that means that no matter what input I put in, all of them are going to get mapped into features which are very close to each other, right? And that would also end up being an issue because then I cannot really distinguish between examples. And, you know, this was the fundamental reason, you know, what made it hard to train very deep networks. And we're going to see this a bit more formally now, right? So I'm going to consider a simplistic scenario where suppose if we had linear activation and we're going to assume that, you know, X and W's are, you know, independent over here then I can express the variance of my output in terms of the variance of the weights and the variance of my inputs and the number of units that I have in my inputs, right? So this is, you know, something that we can write down. Now, where does the variance in weights comes from? It comes from the initialization, right? So typically you would initialize the weights by sampling from say a normal distribution. So the variance W would correspond to the standard deviation or the variance of the normal distribution. And variance of X is just the, you know, how much variation you have in your data set, for example. Right. So, and then if we have multiple layers, we can just, you know, keep on stacking this term multiple times so therefore we have a product over the number of layers that we end up having. So now there are two things which could happen, right? Either this variance can, you know, blow up, you know, why could it blow up? For example, you know, consider a case where if some of the eigenvalues of W were large in every layer, right? Then all those big eigenvalues are going to multiply, which is going to increase the variance. And in my forward pass, everything is going to explode. Similarly, consider a scenario where eigenvalues are really small for the weight matrix W, then everything is going to vanish. 
right? So you can get the exploding problem or the vanishing problem in the forward pass, but you could also get the same thing in the backward pass, right? So backward pass is when we calculate the gradient, right? The only difference in the backward and forward pass is instead of having ND in, we end up having ND out, right? I mean, that makes sense because I'm going, you know, backwards. So I hit the output units first and then I hit the input units. So, you know, both in the forward and the backward pass, signals can vanish and explode. So what this meant was that the way we initialize the weights ended up being super critical. So you would see there were, you know, like a bunch of papers which came out, which were trying to suggest clever ways of initializing weights. So, you know, so one aspect of this is, you know, and how do we end up training deep networks? The other aspect of where, you know, this will kind of play in is, you know, suppose I have a network that I initialize and I'm training a reinforcement learning agent. If we don't set the variances carefully, the exploration, the initial exploration of the algorithm could be, you know, could either go well or it could go bad, right? For example, if I initialize my network so that, you know, my actions have, you know, a very, very small variance or very high variance, you know, if the variance is very high, then I'm going to do a lot of random stuff and therefore the variance in policy, the variance in policy gradients is going to increase and that's going to be a problem versus if my actions are all very, very small, what that would mean is we won't end up exploring that much and you would never end up, you know, hitting the reward. So this weight initialization, you know, is also important in the reinforcement learning setup, you know, because it really affects uh, the initial exploration, which the agent is going to perform. So I'll just take a small pause and see you know, if there are any questions about how the weight initialization and the weights can affect or cause exploding or vanishing gradients problem. Any questions, comments? Or if this material is very familiar to all of you, you know, you can ask me to you know, go faster. I'm happy to go faster. I'm happy to slow down. If you want me to cover this, you know, if you want me to cover this in, you know, more detail. Well, you know, I didn't hear back. So I'm presuming we are all, you know, good for now. Okay, perfect. So it seems like the pace is appropriate. Okay, so so one way of tackling this issue was through coming out with bit initializations. And the other big innovation to counter this issue was actually, you know, residual networks. So residual networks have many different motivations of why ResNets work. You know, today we'll, we'll see, you know, one or two but there are many more. So the idea behind residual learning is quite simple. I suppose I have a plain neural network in which I have input X, it's passing through two layers and the output is HX. And what we're hoping is that the two layers are able to fit this function HX. This is what is going to happen in a plain network. So these two layers have the burden of learning HX and so if HX, if HX becomes complex, then this job is going to become harder. So what ends up happening in residual networks is we have, you know, one more, we put the skip connection. What this means is my HX is expressed as FX plus X. So what I'm doing is instead of directly trying to predict my mapping h of x, we're going to approximate it iteratively, right? So for example, 
So suppose if you had a polynomial, which is, you know, x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x4, right? So, you know, if I already have x, then I only need to, you know, model three terms of the polynomial, right? I don't need to model x again. For this iterative approximation, you know, sometimes makes the job of, you know, these two layers easier, right? So this is, you know, one motivation about why residual networks, you know, make the learning be easier, right? So just going back to the example I gave about the polynomials, right? Suppose there were now four residual blocks, which were there, you know, this is one block. I put one more block, one more one block, one more block. Hello. For the first block, for Let's example, talk. wait, it seems like I'm having an echo. Hello. En vrai, c'est bien passé. Je suis un peu oublié parce que la fin du case, dans sa partie numérique, genre, je me suis un peu pré trop précipité. Okay, I guess I had to mute someone. Okay, perfect. So, you know, going back to the example of polynomials. Right. So suppose I had, you know, four stacks of these residual layers for the first stack, you know, could model just X. The second stack could model X squared. The third could model X cube and the fourth could model X to the power four. Right. So each stack just needs to do a small amount of computation. And right? so that's one motivation behind why it becomes easier to learn. Right. The other motivation is that the skip connections can diminish the vanishing gradients problem. Now, why is that? So you can think of this identity matrix, you know, or this, you know, identity connection, which is, you know, plus X is having a weight matrix, which is, is which is an identity weight matrix, right? So I can write it as FX plus WX, where W is an identity matrix, right? So if I have an identity matrix over here, it is increasing the eigenvalues, you know, which goes from the mapping to X to F of X, right? So my effective eigenvalues increase, which means that, you know, we will not end up getting this problem where the gradients become very small, or the activations become very small as we keep on adding the, uh, the number of layers. So, you know, these are, you know, two, you know, high level, you know, intuitions behind why residual networks end up overcoming some of the problems associated with training deep networks. And, you know, to construct, you know, deep, like deep residual networks, like 150 layers, you pretty much take the one block that we had, and then we end up repeating it, right? It's just repetitions of the same block. And, you know, that's it. There's nothing more uh, to it. Now, you know, we can go and, you know, look at the problem that was happening without residual networks. So what I'm going to show is a comparison between plain networks on the left and residual networks on the right. So on the Y axis is the error percentage. So lower is better. On the x-axis is the number of training iterations. So on figure number one, or the figure on the left, what you can see is, as we're increasing the number of layers, the training loss is actually, you know, increasing, which is not good, right? Sorry, I mean, so the training is on the, the dashed lines and testing is the solid lines, right? So the, both the training loss increases and also the the testing loss increases right versus if you end up using resnets the trend reverses right as we add more layers the performance actually improves right so we not only get a lower training error but we also end up getting a lower test error so the takeaway is that it wasn't it wasn't the case that if we have deep networks they end up overfitting the problem was that we just didn't have good ways to train deep networks and residual net, you know, the residual connections or the strip connection as they're called, uh, solve this problem associated with training deep networks. And 
So now, you know, if you look at, you know, computer vision, for example, and it's very common to make use of architectures which are 30 to, you know, 50 or even 100 layers deep. Right? I mean, people not haven't really tried, you know, thousand layers, but I think the ResNet paper did try a thousand layer architecture and show that they could make it to work. But more than thousand layers, I think it's still uncharted territory, which, you know, maybe someday we'll explore. But I think for now, we can pretty much assume that, you know, most of deep reinforcement learning is five layers of less. You know, some self-supervised learning, imitation learning will be in this range of, you know, five to 30 layers at most. So that's the kind of, you know, regime that we're going to operate in. So that's all I will say about, you know, residual networks. So I'll take a small pause and see if there are any questions over here. If not, we'll jump on to, you know, more architectures. So can you say again the difference in skip and identity skip? So sometimes, you know, let's go, let's go back. So sometimes when you do a mapping, the mapping is just plus X, which is, you know, the identity skip connection. But sometimes, you know, you might also put some weight over here and then you know, added. For example, you can just put one layer over here, which would become WX. So in that case, it would be a non-identity skip connection. So skip pretty much just means that I am not sequentially processing my outputs, but I can skip a few layers. For example, I could skip five layers and replace that by one layer, and that could be my alternate pathway. I hope that answered the question. Cool. So, you know, connets and, you know, deep connets and residual networks, you know, these kind of architectures will be useful when we are dealing with image observations, which is the case in a lot of applications. But there are going to be other applications where we need to go beyond uh, convolutional networks or, or even fully connected networks, right? So some examples are physics where we you know might need to model interactions between particles or for example in chemistry right where we need to model interactions between molecules right or even in an image if we want to model relationships between objects for example over here the guy is on top of the horse the horse is on the right of the dog and the car is on the left of the dog, right? So we might care about these kinds of relationships. And, you know, these also come in naturally in text and in, you know, many other domains such as social networks and so on and so forth. So in order to deal with, you know, these kind of structured data, one architecture that you can make use of is uh, graph neural networks. So what is the idea behind graph neural networks? Right, so suppose, you know, I have a graph which describes the data to begin with. Right? For example, in a molecule, the structure of the molecule describes a graph. So we are going to first look at that given a graph, how can we uh, use neural networks to make use of the graph structure? And then we will look at how we can learn the graph if the graph has not been provided a priori. Right? So first let's assume the graph has been given. So the way to deal with this data is suppose I have, you know, these, each node is some feature X1 to X4. And what we end up doing is, you know, I have this node X1, it's going to get mapped to a feature Z1 in the next layer. 
and the C1 could just be a linear layer. For example, Z is ReLU WX, and I'm going to apply the same layer to all of these different nodes, right? So we end up getting Z1 to Z4. Right. Now, what I also know is that there's some relationship which says that Z1 is connected to Z2, Z3, Z4, but not to other nodes. Right? So in order to account for information from its neighbors, we can devise many different mechanisms. So one such mechanism, which is the simplest one, is that I can average the features corresponding to my neighbors. Right. Now you might say, well, averaging is a very simple operation which can lead to loss of information. Yes, it can, but you know, hold that question, you know, for a bit. And you know, you will see how or why it may or may not be an issue. In general, I mean, you could use any reduction function which can go from a set of neighbors to a constant size feature vector. Right? You can use any pooling operation. Right? Then we're going to do the same thing for Z3, right? So essentially we do the same operation for each node in this graph. And then we're going to repeat the process and then we're going to repeat the process and finally go to the output. So because we are stacking, you know, many layers uh, one after another, even if we end up using a simple averaging operation, because there are many layers of computation, it ends up modeling, you know, complex functions. But you know, if you're really particular that you don't want to use an average, you could do max pooling or you could try other kinds of pooling strategies also. And you know, if you wanted to reduce the entire graph into a fixed size feature vector, you can take this output and just do some pooling across all the nodes. Right? So what is essentially happening, right? So in layer one, information propagates from just the nearby neighbors to one node. But in layer two, now the information is going to propagate from these, you know, these nodes also to this node. And this information gets propagated to this one, right? So as I am increasing the number of layers, we are getting information to propagate from farther and farther away points in the graph. So as I'm adding more layers, my representation at each node is accounting for information at all the other nodes, right? So if you go deep enough, you know, each node has access to information at all, all the nodes. So intuitively that is what depth is doing in graph neural networks. Right? It's dictating, you know, how many hops away do you want the information to come from? So any questions on graph neural networks? No. Okay. So, you know, just as an anecdote again, so one place where you will see, you know, the use of graph neural networks is, for example, the playing the Dota or playing StarCraft. Uh, so playing Dota, so Dota is a game, you know, which OpenAI was tackling with help of reinforcement learning. And then StarCraft was being tackled by DeepMind and you know there are some papers which end up utilizing architectures which look like graph neural networks to model different agents in the game and the interactions between them but you might also be interested in you know other things for example you know molecule design or drug design and so on where you might want to apply reinforcement learning where you cannot use cnns but these architecture or graph neural networks could be quite useful. So, okay. So now, you know, so the one thing which I mentioned was we are going to learn how to build a graph if the graph is not given to us in advance. Right? So that 
we are going to come to but i'm going to motivate or i'm going to introduce you know build up to that by using you know examples or you know by also considering another use case where data is sequential right for example you know adam went to the kitchen or you know in language you know things come in sequence and there are many many other things you know many other domains where you know the sequence is really important right so you know one question is you know how do we learn from sequential data the second question is you know how do we construct uh, graphs when the graph is not known you know what we'll end up seeing is that both of these problems have a very similar solution at the end of the day and you know just you know if you are looking for the answer that answer is going to be transformers in the end and we're going to build from you know sequential data or from this you know sequential data to or, or sorry we're going to build from some very simple networks to process sequential data to um, much more complex methods which will end up in the state of the art which is transformers for now so you know how do we ta typically tackle this problem of sequential data so you know first i'm going to assume that i'm dealing with sequential data where my vocabulary is finite right for example i have a set of tokens which are coming in sequence so we we, we can assume that i have a dictionary of words and suppose this dictionary is d so if my dictionary is d then every word can be represented in what is called as a one hot encoding so for example you know to re represent rome i could say that i have a dictionary which each element in this feature vector represents whether that dictionary element is present or not right and it's an exclusive embedding that if it means that there's only one dimension which is set to 1 all the other dimensions are set to 0 so rome would have this embed uh, this representation paris would have this italy would have this france would have this so on and so forth so this is referred to as one hot encoding so whenever you have a discrete choice and you want to represent it one hot encoding is the way to go the alternative could have been that you said rome is one paris is two italy is three france is four but that is incorrect because when you say you know rome is one and paris is two you're assuming there is some metric space which relates rome with paris and paris with italy but there isn't you know but paris is not twice of rome and italy is not thrice of rome right so those representations are not good so if you do have some discrete information you want to represent you know go for one hot encoding so now you know suppose you know we have this access to one hot encoding what are the challenges that you know one needs to deal with right so the first challenge is that every sentence has a different number of words so for example if i even if i have a fixed dimensional embedding for each word where the dimensions of each word is the same as the dictionary size the feature representation of the entire sentence is going to be variable right because each sentence has a different number of words now the other issue is that there are long range dependencies what do i mean by that is that the token which comes you know pretty early on might affect the token which is coming much later right so there's a long range dependency a similarly you know assume that you are doing maze navigation like if you turn incorrect initially and right, you might miss the corridor and never get to the reward versus if you take the correct direction initially you can get a reward but after a long period of time right so there is this aspect of long range dependency that we need to account for and you know it gets hard to you know model these kind of long range dependencies just by having 
convolutions. So it's a fun question to think about, you know, why convolutions are not appropriate for modeling long range dependencies. Right? So something to think about, you know, happy to chat about it in office hours or if we have more time uh, after the lecture. So the simplest method that or before I did go into methods, is the, the setup clear with the problem setup clear, one not encoding, what the challenges are, any questions on this part? No. Okay. So, you know, let's go and develop, you know, the, the, the simplest possible method to deal with sequential data. Right? So, you know, one possibility is that I have this function f, which maps one word x1 to the word z1, right? And f, for example, could be a multi-layer neural network. And z1 is what I'm going to call the word embedding of x1. Similarly, I can compute the embedding of each word in the sentence. So we end up with z1 to zn. Now, if I want to reduce my sentence into a fixed size feature representation, what can I do? So I mean, you might first ask me, you know, why do I want to reduce the whole sentence into a fixed size feature representation? Right. The answer or the answer to that is that, you know, if you want to do some processing, right? For example, if you want to do classification, you know, you have a layer, you have, you know, your classifier, which takes in a feature representation and then you know, for example, it could be a linear classifier, which takes the inner product with a, with a weight matrix, right? So this weight matrix has fixed dimensions. Similarly, you know, if you're doing actions, you might still have, you know, a linear layer at the end, which is your readout layer. And so it becomes, because of practical constraints, it becomes sometimes necessary to reduce things to a fixed size feature representation. So, so now, okay, given that we want to reduce the whole sentence into a fixed size feature representation, and I've computed some features of each word, and I have z1 to zn, you know, what can I do to get a fixed size embedding? Right. You know, do people want to comment or, you know, the shout out? and say, you know, what could be some reasonable choices over here? That seems like we don't have any comments. So you know, I will, you know, move along. Seems like, you know, we want uh, some coffee for everyone. You know, it's Thursday afternoon, you know, time when it's easy to get sleepy. So there's one, one suggestion, which is, you know, concat and transform. So, you know, it's a good suggestion, but one thing to think about is if you're concatenating, but then the number of words in the sentence are variable, then the concatenation would also become variable size. Right? And therefore transforming with the FC layer would be problematic because that means the FC layer should also be variable size. Right? So, So another suggestion which comes up is, you know, pass the sequence into a recurrent architecture. 
okay i mean that is something that we will end up doing eventually so i'm going i'm building towards the current architectures right so so even simpler than doing recurrent architecture to process the sequential data you know could be to have a pooling function for example just doing the average pooling for example for instance right and that might produce me y hat over here and then this g is called the pooling function could just be average pooling right so that's a very simple model that i can construct and it you know satisfies the intended purpose of taking the whole sentence and representing it with a fixed dimensional feature vector right now when it satisfies one goal you know if g is just taking an average of z1 to zn what it does is it removes all sequential information right the fact that z2 comes after z1 and z3 comes after z2 all that information goes away right so in many scenarios we do want to preserve that information and right? so we don't want to ignore the ordering so what choices can we make in that setup right so you know let's you know look at how do we solve that problem so again you know i have words x1 to xn which have been converted into features z1 to zn right now what we are going to do is we are going to condition the feature computation of my word of my current word also on the features of my past word so you know writing it down mathematically earlier what we had was the feature embedding of each word depended only on the word itself right so x z1 only was dependent on x1 zn only depended on xn now what we are doing is something you know slightly different right so now we have you know z1 depends on x1 but z2 also depends on z1 and z3 will also depend on z2 but z2 depends on z1 so you know so eventually z3 also ends up depending both on z1 and z2 right so if we are willing to add this one connection so that z1 goes as an input to feature computation of z2 then the feature vector zn actually does depend on the entire sequence of words from x1 to xn right so this is what this particular connection ends up doing so write it another way you know i have x to z and is going to break this mapping into two layers right in just two components just to uh make it in the same notational convention as you would find in textbooks or you know many other materials right so over here i'm first going to take my x and convert it into h and this we are doing through say a linear layer wxh and we are putting some nonlinearity q right now this h is typically you know what we would call as the hidden layer and then we are processing h through one more linear function and a nonlinearity now what is this you know concatenation or the dot product you know doing over here it will become you know clear so essentially what happens is you know instead of putting zt you know we are typically putting ht as you know we are conditioning the computation of zt plus 1 through this intermediate feature activation ht right? and then we keep on repeating the same process over and over again right so you know i'm just going to rewrite it again you know 
So this architecture, you know, that we just wrote down, where you know xt1 and ht produces ht plus one, which you know leads to zt plus one, and so on and so forth, is you know what we call as a recurrent neural network. But you can also see this as an equivalent deep network with n layers, right? So why did I distinguish between ht plus one and zt plus one? Because z is typically you know supposed to be the output after you know all the processing has happened, right? For example, instead of just having you know one layer of recurrent network, you might have multiple such layers, and the output is what you're going to call as z. And you know, just for that notational convenience, or just because there is a precedence of, you know, how people uh, or what names people use for feature activation in different layers. You know, I'm just distinguishing between H and Z over here. So, recurrent neural network is you know just conditioning my current value based on the past value. And everything else, you know, remains the same, right? And and recurrent neural network, you can think of it also as a deep network with n layers. And therefore, this I so this thing that we discussed, right? That if I have very deep networks, we end up getting vanishing gradient, or the problem of uh, exploding gradients, right? So recurrent networks have the same problem. And so they're very prone to vanishing or uh, or exploding gradients problem. So therefore, if you have two model sequences which are super long, that ends up being a problem. And you have to use one question versus positional encoding done as one hot or just a scalar. It's neither, as Jacob pointed out, it's a complex and a solid function. And you know, there is a reason for why it works better. You know, I think for details, you can look in the paper. So, yes. So, I mean, the, the, the problem with one hot is that, you know, one hot encodes, one hot assumes that you already know how long the sentences can be in advance, which is not true. The problem with just a scalar is that, you know, I mean, it's an empirical finding that instead of using scalar, if you use sinusoids, you know, it ends up working much nicer. So there's one more question of how do we handle long continuous data stream? Are we manually cutting it into certain sizes? So if you look at the transformer architecture, you don't have to cut it manually into any such size. You can apply this idea of self attention, you know, that we discussed on the previous slide, right? I mean, this idea you can apply over an arbitrarily long sequence. The problem will be your computational cost is going to grow quadratically. If, for example, if I have n symbols, there are n square operations I need to do because each query goes to each key. So there are n squared pairs. Does that answer your question? So while, you know, so there's one other question is, what if, so in, you know, I guess this is in context of graph networks. So what if we also have the edge features in the graph? How do we compute attention weights in that case then? So you can compute the attention weights as we are computing in self-attention right now. You know, you could, you know, use the edge information additionally, right? For example, you know, you could have something which, you know, biases the attention based on whether you have an edge or not. That could be one mechanism. Or you can always set the attention of that edge to be one. And you can, 
you know, so that could be another method. So I think these are all the heuristics over here because the question is, do you trust the edge that you already have? If you already trust it, then you don't need to find the tension. But if you don't trust it, then you might want to find or learn it from data. Right. So depending on you know how much you trust the edge given to you versus how much you don't trust it, you know that would lead to different ways of incorporating that information. Right. And to answer you know the follow-up question to is there any way to cut down the computation cost yes there is so you know there have been a lot of follow-up papers to transformers looking exactly at this question so i think we can you know if you maybe put a piazza post on this happy to post some papers which are uh, cutting down the computation cost in transformers It's a whole cottage industry at this point. Okay. So, you know, that was the transformer, you know, architecture or the self attention architecture. And this, you know, would end up being useful if you're doing reinforcement learning, but you want to model long term dependencies in, you know, the sequence of states and actions that the agent ends up taking right so we will end up covering a few more architectures in the next lecture but you know before going into architectures you know, i would like to talk about one or two other things so you know one thing is you know regularizers which are there in deep learning there are many different kinds of regularizers. For example, you can think of architectures being one kind, like CNN imposes some kind of structural information, which is spatial invariance. You know, graph networks impose you know some other prior in my data. Right? Then, you know, there are other explicit regularizers such as dropouts, bash norm weight decay and so on you know there are some other implicit regularizers such as sgd and the network depth right so you know i think if you are using uh you know if you're going to use deep networks or deep rl in your course project i think it's important to know at least about things which are listed on this slide you know batch norm weight decay dropouts you know sgd and you know these architectures i think this is something that you should know about so now batch norm i have some slides you know over here if you want to look at them i'm not going to discuss them you know but these slides are there just in case you know you want to uh, get a hang of it now before you know i end the lecture i'll end the lecture with you know maybe some you know food for thought and that food for thought comes from this forward and reverse scale. But the reason I'm covering, you know, a couple of these concepts is because they keep on coming over and over again. And it's just good to understand them once. Right. So now suppose I have some distribution uh, P. Right. And there are two kinds of KL divergences I can write. One which is called the forward KL, where I have some ground truth P and Q theta is what I am trying to learn. So my goal is I want to learn a distribution which is as close to P as possible. Let's suppose the distribution is Q of theta. So one thing which I can write is a forward KL, which is P KL Q theta. The other, other way I can write this is Q theta KL P which is the reverse scale, right? So it turns out these two forward and reverse scale have very different interpretations. So when I write the forward scale, and if I minimize this distance function, this function Q 
has a behavior which is as if it was finding the mean of the distribution, right? So this choice of Q actually minimizes the distance with P. Right? What's this reverse scale? And you know we can write it down. You know what is the KL distance? This is just the formula for the KL distance, and you know we can write it down as you know EPX log Q theta x. And I have just ignored this term EPX log PX because the this term does not depends on the parameters theta, so it will go it will zero out when I'm taking gradients with respect to it, right? So for uh, the purpose of minimization of the KL distance, I only have this term sitting over here. Okay. And reverse scale, on the other hand, what it does is it covers only the mode of the distribution. It picks up on one mode. So it's mode seeking. So if you have a distribution and you want to you know, capture the mean behavior, you would typically use the forward KL distance. If you only want to capture one mode of the distribution, maybe the dominant one, you would end up using the reverse scale, right? So how is the reverse scale? You know, I'm just going to write it down again. It comes down to this form, right? I've just written down the two terms. And in this case, I do need both the terms because my expectation is with respect to Q theta and theta does, and Q theta depends on the parameters theta. Now, you know, what we will see going in the next lecture is how forward and reverse scale pretty much correspond to supervised learning versus reinforcement learning. So if you're curious you know, about it, you know, maybe just take up you know, where we are ending today. Don't look at the slide PDF, but you know, try to see how forward scale is equivalent to supervised learning and reverse scale ends up being equivalent to reinforcement learning. Now, this is something we will discuss in more detail in the next lecture. But if you're curious, you know, I really, I encourage you to try deriving it on your own. Right, with that, uh, I'm going to stop and take any questions.